Tasha DeLay and welcome. Uh, this morning I wanted to begin by looking at a text called Naked Seeing, a book by uh, Christopher Hatchell. It's a somewhat academic text, but it's got some interesting information about the development of Togal, and so I thought I would share some of that because it provides some additional context to what we normally get in terms of how this has developed. And so I'm going to read a couple of sections for you here, beginning on page 11. And it says that the traditions examined here are distinctive in presenting a developmental model of vision. So part of what he is talking about here is the idea that as these developed, particularly with the Sarma traditions in the uh, 12th, 13th century, and we see these coming into Tibet and developing, and they brought with them things from India, but it also created a new renaissance in terms of the uh, development of Buddhism in Tibet. And so we get that mixture of things going on and generating ideas. So one of the things that came out of India as a part of that was the Kala Chakra Tantra, which was relatively new, at least from academic point of view. Um, it's all considered within the tradition to be uh, much older than that, of course. But that development is an important part of that, uh, going back to the Nyingma, uh, and its development originally in the uh, 8th century with Padmasambhava and Shantarakshita coming into Tibet to do, give teachings and the development of uh, Samye Monastery, the first monastery, Buddhist monastery in Tibet and so forth. And then the Bon tradition, which also has a very strong Dzogchen tradition as a part of it. There's some controversy about which came first, the, the Nyingma version or the Bon tradition. Um, and there's evidence going both ways, although the preponderance of evidence, at least at this time, tends to say that the Nyingma tradition came first and the Bon bar uh, borrowed uh, heavily from that. But the point that's being made here is that those three traditions kind of came together at that point in time of this renaissance, the new development of uh, Buddhism in Tibet. So that's a little bit of context here for this section. So these are not visions that provide instant access to alternate worlds or that result in sudden encounters with fully formed deities. Rather, they are visions that unfold over time, beginning with an experience of unstructured bits of light like sparks, flashes of luminosity, fireflies, radiant nets, showers of rain, or concentric circles called tigli. Eventually, over days or weeks, these signs begin to take representational form and ultimately coalesce into images of deities, divine retinues, mandalas, and pure environments. So part of what we're seeing is based on natural uh, things that we see with our eyes, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the science behind all of this, we begin seeing things that then merge into these other forms, so the deities and the, the mandalas and so forth that come out of that. Continuing on here, he says, the notion of enlightenment changes, however, when it is brought into the visionary context. Under the influence of these traditions, interest in the dynamics of light and ultimate Buddha Buddhist attainment comes to involve features like dissolving or burning away the body's atoms and physical elements, such as a particular practitioner attains a body of composed a body composed of light much like the bodies of divinities that a yogi sees in vision so when we envision the deity during deity practice we envision it as a body of light the sambhokakaya form much like a rainbow which is visible and yet you can't grasp onto it Finally, vision here is a part of Buddhism that is difficult to separate from philosophical views and abstract ideas. Literary accounts of these visions treat them not as a fantastic or otherworldly experiences, but as esoteric counterparts to traditional Buddhist epistemologies, and as alternative ways of negotiating difficult intellectual issues such as the relationship between emptiness and appearances. 
And so a part of this then carries this into this philosophical point of view, the understanding of emptiness being a key word here as a part of this. So uh, the nature and understanding of emptiness from this visionary perspective actually changes a little bit. So that is another key part of what he's addressing in this text. I'm going to go a little bit further into the text here, uh, starting on page 52, and uh, continue with some of what he is describing. It is critical to remember that the intellectual roots of the great perfection are indeed deep in India. Given the tradition's affinity with Indian thought on Buddha nature, Gnostic elements of Buddhist uh, completion stage practices, the Guya Garbha Tantra, and forms of non-dual Kashmiri Shaivism. It is also clear that by Tibetan standards, the tradition is genuinely old, as groups referring to themselves as great perfection indeed existed in the late 8th to 9th centuries, and the core ideas emerged through, though transformed, after Tibet's period of fragmentation. So the period of fragmentation was after Langdharma came in and, and basically destroyed the, the monasteries and told everybody to go home or convert to the Bon religion and so forth. So there was a period of a couple hundred years after that then uh, that Buddhism was practiced primarily on an individual basis and instead of on a group basis and certainly no uh, monastic support or very little for it. Uh, there were perhaps some small centers out uh, in outreach areas in, uh, that were unaffected by this, but the main areas of central Tibet were. The earliest stratum of the Great Perfection is now called Mind Series, or Simdi, which we've talked about before. Though it is not clear if this was a united movement or even if Mind Series was always synonymous with the Great Perfection. Nonetheless, an early body of Great Perfection literature called the 18 Texts of the Mind Series, perhaps dating from the late 8th to late 10th centuries, laid down Great Perfection's thematic core setting the basic format around which later iterations of the Great Perfection were built. The Mind Series literature presents a blend of radical emptiness and speculation on the agency of a luminous awareness in the universe, presenting a state of affairs where all beings and all appearances are themselves a singular enlightened gnosis of the Buddha all good, Samatabhadra or Kuntu Sampo. It also shows a disinterest in specifying any kind of structured practices or concepts via which one could connect with that gnosis. Rather, the tradition argues here that not, there is nothing to do and nothing to survive for, so the reality of all good will manifest in its immediacy just by relaxing and letting go. So we've talked much about that, just relaxing and letting go is the main part of the trek chow practice in particular. A short mind series poem called The Cuckoo of Awareness, which we looked at before, exemplifies this strain of thought. In variety there is no difference, and in parts a freedom from elaborations, things as they are things as things are, are not conceptual, but the shining forth of appearances is all good. Since you are finished, cast off the sickness of effort. Resting naturally, leave things as they are. So that gives a real good idea, the basic idea, particularly behind the mind series, but it's integrated into the other ones, the space series and the uh, uh, Trek Cho and Togal as well. In the Renaissance, the themes exemplified here, equality, simplicity, non-conceptuality, letting go, the manifestation of appearances, and the Buddha all good, remain at the center of the great perfection, but become elaborated in a variety of increasingly technical and practical ways. Great perfection then became a name for a wide variety of movements, not controlled by any central authority, who shared a core commitment to the rhetoric of pristine gnosis, but incorporated it into their own diverse interests in esoteric philosophy, ritual, death-related practice, sexuality, medicine, and alchemy. As a result, during the Renaissance, the great perfection began to take on many of the characteristics of Tantra that it once seemed to reject. Rituals, initiations, concrete practices, systematic thought, and sexuality. 
Yet, even as the great perfection moved closer to classical Tantra, it sought ways to do so by remaining true to its early rhetorical core. Exemplifying this is a set of visionary practices that rose to popularity in the 11th century, in, which in many ways served to reenact the scenario found in the cuckoo of awareness. They involved letting go of conceptuality so that an inner gnosis of, at the heart, identified with the Buddha all good, would shine forth in to appearance. In the Nyingma Great Perfection, these visionary practices are most associated with a movement known as Seminal Heart or Ningtek, the heart essence. One of many incipient Great Perfection movements and lineages competing and overlapping with each other in the Renaissance. The seminal heart would, attain, would eventually attain dominance and determine the direction of the Nyingma Great Perfection as a whole. In terms of its innovations, the seminal heart brought to the great perfection a distinctive Gnostic cosmogony in which the a luminous awareness burst forth from a container, bringing about the world. This creation narrative is then mirrored in visionary yogas where light bursts from the container of the body to be seen with the eyes. So coming out from the heart up through the Kati channel and out through the eyes and displayed on this huge screen of blue that we call the sky. In turn, these visions are accounted for with new ideas about the structure and formation of the human body, which map the body with luminous energy channels and describe their functions as driven by transcendent dimensions of the body's elements, winds, and seminal nuclei, or tigli. So get a little bit of an idea. We'll come back to this book and look at some other uh, qualities associated with this, including his look at some of the scientific reasons that some of these things happen in our visionary experiences that we have. But it took this as something that was a real experience, things that we actually can see with our eyes, and then through the philosophical understanding of those things, transform it in a different way than had been done in Buddhism, even though there are uh, inferences that go back very, very early in the tradition. But it really blossomed during this uh, Renaissance period uh, when the Sarma schools began to develop in Tibet. <laughs>